This is Misty Penrod, April Hedrick, and Laura Martin. We are here at Greensboro College Friday, November 2nd to conduct an interview on the history of J.C. Price School. Today we have with us <coughs> Jane Higgins, a native of Greensboro, who was both a teacher and student at J.C. Price School. What years did you attend J.C. Price School as a student? J.C. Price from 1953 to 1959, from 4th through 9th grade. Um, as a teacher, what years did you teach at J.C. Price School? 1966 to 1971. What subjects did you teach at J.C. Price? I taught... Um, 7th grade life science, 8th grade earth science, 6th grade language arts, and spelling. And my degree was in biology, so it's kind of out of field. <laughs> <laughs> so you taught everything. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of everything. What attracted you um, about the Price School? What did you like most about Price? Well, when I graduated from college, my intention was not to teach. I wanted to do something else. I wanted to be a medical technologist. And I had applied at a school and never heard. And uh, when I went to ask them, they had filed my uh, application in with the custodians and mates. Uh, so... Uh, and my dad kept saying, you need to get a job, you need to find a job, and I was getting married. So I decided, okay, I can teach, I have a teaching degree. And I applied late in July. And in those days, you really didn't have a choice of where, you know, you didn't pick. Like now, teachers can kind of say, well, I want to go to this school, I want to work with this population. And at the time, we had two middle schools, Lincoln and Price and one high school, Dudley. Uh, and they had an opening at Price, so that's how I got there. I had nothing to do with deciding. I was just told that I would be assigned to J.C. Price. <coughs> and then, um, how much guidance or supervision did you have in what you taught or how you taught it? Did you get to um, the curriculum? We had a basic curriculum guide and a textbook and a teacher's edition. But as far as a standard course of study and all of the pacing guides and things, we did not have that. And in those days, you were allowed to be a lot more creative. Uh, you had certain things that you had to teach, but you weren't teaching to a test. You were teaching the subject matter and, and doing fun, hands-on things. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was fortunate to go back to Price because by me have been, having been a student there, everybody wanted to make sure that I succeeded. So I was known by the staff as Baby Jane. And <laughs> they uh, helped me. You know, they made sure, they tried to make sure that things worked, and they helped me and, and, and encouraged me to do things and to try new things. And I don't know why they were telling me to try them, it's because they didn't want to do them, and usually get the new person on the staff to, to do what no one else does. But I did have that, that cushion. They were my mentors, even though they weren't really called that. Okay. So it was a family like that, Ms. Um. Did the curriculum change over time while you were teaching at Price? No. We had the uh, basic same books, and new things came out, and I would try them based on my reading or what I got in uh, educational magazines or and things like that. And there was a, at that time, there was a science teachers meeting uh, once a month, biology teachers, science teachers, and I would go to that. And we also had a science supervisor that you could call and, and get ideas and things from. So, uh, but it's basically stayed the same. 
Now, we noticed in the Peeler papers that it would seem like at Price a third grade would pop up every once in a while. When you were there or when you taught there, was um, there a third grade at Price? Do you know why it kept popping up and being removed, the third grade? I can only guess that maybe the element, the other school may have been overcrowded. The feeder schools, Jacksonville and David D. Jones. I didn't know that there was a third grade when I was at, uh, what was Jacksonville, and it's now David D. Jones. Mm -hmm. But then when I went and started fourth grade. So there was like an elementary school that was K, um, first, second, third grades at that time? Mm -hmm. Not K. Not K? Just first, first, second, third. third. Okay. And that was called Jacksonville, and then Jacksonville became David E. Jones. Mm -hmm. Did you live in Warnersville? I did live in Warnersville. I grew up in Mr. Unthank's house. I don't know if you've done any. Um, he was the person <coughs> that decided to develop the area one of Warnersville for African Americans. Mm -hmm. And he had, uh, I meant to bring a picture of my house. He had uh, a home uh, and my grand, my grandfather, great-grandfather, was able to purchase the house from him. So we grew up in mm -hmm. that house. It had three levels. Uh, two porches, um, five bedrooms, a garage, a lot of land or whatever. So I don't want to say this the wrong way, but I may have been considered the poor little rich girl, the person that really didn't belong at price because my house was... As I look back, it was a lot better, but as a child, I didn't really notice the difference. Now that I've gotten older, I can appreciate the history and the architecture of the house. And My house is a house where everybody came to play. I was the first to have a TV, so everybody came to my house to look at television. And I need to, go, I need to say, this is not in your, 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 your write-up or whatever, mm -hmm. but I come from a family of educators. My dad was a principal for 44 years. My mom taught first grade for 40 years. My aunt that actually lived in the house and that I stayed with while my parents taught out of school, uh, out of town, uh, had started a daycare. So I was literally surrounded by educators. So I guess that's another reason I grew up. <laughs> ended up being a teacher. Now, where was your father a principal at? My father was a principal in a little bitty town called Lumberbridge, North Carolina, uh, and it was Oak Ridge High School, and it went from grades 1 through 12. And my mom was the first grade teacher, and that's where they met when she came to work at the school. But because it was a country town and during September and October, the kids got out early to go pull tobacco or whatever. They didn't want me to go to school there. Mm -hmm. So they left me here with my aunt. Okay. Uh, and they came home on weekends and summers. So uh, that's how I got to stay in Greensboro. Okay, let's see. Um on the one hand, what evidence did you see of the negative effects of segregation and discrimination in Warnersville? Because it was asking, um, living in Warnersville, I guess when the community got broken up, were you still there then or no? Uh, when the community was broken up, uh, I had gone to college when they started doing that. and. My aunts, and it still bothers me to just to this day, I don't know why they tore down that house because it has a, a lot of history. So it was one of the ones that were torn down for redevelopment, and now there's <coughs> a big pile of dirt where the, the house used to be. Uh, at the time, and this may sound dumb, I probably didn't realize that I was segregated 
I mean, I knew that there was a difference. I knew that when I went downtown, I had to go certain places. I knew I had to sit certain places. I knew I couldn't do certain things. But in Warnersville, we had a doctor. We had a movie theater. We had a school. We had plenty of churches. There were stores. There was the, the, the pool hall. They had their little clubs. That, of course, I didn't go to 8, 9, and 10. But it was a self-containing community. Mm -hmm. And everybody looked out for everybody. Else. It was the family thing. So even though we weren't a part of the white culture, so to speak, uh, we had our own culture and we basically did things within our own. We had beauty shops, barber shops, those kinds of things. Uh, so I knew, yes, I didn't go to school with Caucasian children or whatever. But I had gone to school and started school in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I had been in an integrated situation, I think. Uh, and I think when you're a child, you, you realize the difference, but you just see children to play with. You don't really look at, this person is a lot different for me, this person is a lot different for me. Uh, I did hear that there were some, some changes, that our books were not always the new books. Uh, I did realize that a little bit later that white teachers made more than African American teachers. Mm. There was a white pay scale and there was a black scale, pay scale. But as far as Warnersville, we were, uh, a lot of people considered us the bad side of town. And by I mean bad. <laughs> Uh, we considered Market Street the bad part of town. The people lived on Market Street considered Warnersville the, the, the bad side of town. But I felt very safe. I could go anywhere in Warnersville. And I talk to people now, you know, even though there may have been a wino on the street or whatever, they never bothered you. So I could go to the drugstore at 9 o'clock and, and, and feel okay. And my parents felt comfortable sending me. And if someone approached you, somebody would say, oh, you know, that's Miss Willie Bell Hagee's niece. You better, you know, leave her alone. She's, she's a good girl, that kind of thing. So it, it, was, it was really a family mm -hmm. neighborhood. So um, there were differences, but I guess we compensated when we learned. How much connection or interaction was there between Warnersville community and the teacher or administration at Price, especially Principal Peeler? There was a great bit, bit of connection uh, between the teachers and the uh, community because a lot of the teachers actually lived in the community. So on my way to school, I could pass Ms. Moore's house or Mrs. Harrison's house, who was an older teacher there, or and Mr. Peeler didn't actually live in the community, but they were always there, and most of the churches were in our community. So they either went to our church, or the church was down the street, or we had activities together. So the community uh, and the, the teachers and the principals, there was a lot of interaction, and they would call parents and make home visits and those kind of things. That's unheard of today. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of your uh, memories of Price School, like your fondest memories as a student or an um, educator? I wrote a poem when we had the J.C. Price um, Family reunion. I mean, yeah, it's family reunion. I'm not gonna read my poem, but what do you remember about J.C. Price? Uh, I remember the poems we used to learn. Uh, poems like trees, songs like the Camp Town Ladies. Uh, we were one of the only schools that had a dark room for developing pictures, and Mr. Peeler was very big with audiovisual. So he made sure that we had the latest AV equipment and the latest whatever was out, we had it. Um, we had movies in the auditorium. Those were our treats for being good when you got to the junior high school part. We had basketball games in the gym where we played uh, other 
junior high schools, uh, one of the things that I remember every teacher had to have an assembly program. It didn't matter whether you taught art, math, music, PE, if you had a homeroom class, your class had to put on an assembly program. And that was when I was there as a student and also when I went back as a teacher. I was responsible for uh, two assembly programs that were being narrowed out to two, and then also every teacher had to do the hall bulletin board. So uh, we had drama groups, chorus, and a marching band, and I was in the marching band. And my husband's mother, Frankie Higgins, was instrumental in us getting the first band uniforms. So I was there when we got the first black and gold band uniforms for J.C. Price. And we always marched in um, Auntie's Homecoming Parade and the Christmas Parade. Those are the things I looked forward to. And I still love to march. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went on to be in Dudley's band. Um, we had a debate team. At Price we were taught to project our voices and to speak so sometimes I speak loud and most of the time I don't need a mic if it's not a big room uh, but that came from we sometimes we didn't have the best mics or if you were speaking so you learned to project and to talk without a mic especially if you were doing plays and things and a lot of the assemblies we had were plays uh, we wrapped the maypole we had majorettes uh, we had a Miss J.C. Price. We had the J.C. Price Newsreel, which was our school paper. It came out three or four times a year. And it was always fun to see your name in the paper. Uh, you got to decorate the, the gym auditorium for the prom, and that was fun. There was a sixth grade dance group. And I remember the buses that came in from Sugartown and Terracotta and Pomona, because that's where all of the uh, kids came from all over. They were they lived in the county, but they all came to Price. Uh, I remember one of my fondest memories is it's where I met my husband. Uh, but we didn't date till we were in college. I went to Hampton University, uh, and he was there. So we didn't really date, but we kind of talked and played around. So I've, I had known him since I was in the sixth grade, and he was in the seventh grade. Oh, wow. So. But he died in 99. He was the uh, former principal of Smith High School from 70 seven to ninety one and then he worked in administration downtown. Very good. Oh and we used to go to the symphony. <laughs> so we did a lot of things. Uh, and I think we did some of those things because of Mr. Peeler's vision and his love for cameras and video equipment. We had a little radio station. So. Mm -hmm. Um, how would you judge the quality of education at Christ when you were there as a student and a teacher? As I s you kind of answered that, but <laughs> it seems incredible. But as a student, I think I got a very good education. I um, learn the basics. The English, the diagramming, the sentences, all of the things that we don't do now in school. We were taught so that we were prepared for any kind of test. So we weren't taught the test, so to speak, but we were taught how to think and how to solve the problems or whatever may come up on the test. In my personal opinion now is we're testing too much mm -hmm. and uh, there's no time for creativity there's no time to teach critical thinking it's like you know it's rote so when you get to the test if what you weren't taught isn't on there then you have a lot hard time but you know we were taught facts mm -hmm. and things that you remember and that you can still remember now like parts of speech math facts just the basics 
and then you get uh, spell just the, the normal things that uh, I think grammar and things like that I think you need in order to get a good foundation and reading and learning to read aloud and learning to read with expression and, and stopping for punctuation. And our kids don't do that today. They just I mean they just read, they don't pause, they don't stop or in a lot of cases they can't read. And I think in those days I'm not gonna sit here and tell you I liked every teacher at Price. I did not have all good experiences at Price School. Um, but I think the bottom line is that they did care. And they wanted to make sure that we left there with the good education and a good background and a foundation. So I feel now that the, the kids that left Price and maybe went to high school and maybe didn't go on to college, compared to kids that leave junior high school now and maybe graduate from high school, I don't think they have the same education. I don't think they can do the same thing. Because we didn't have calculators. <laughs> uh, you know, you had to figure out things yourself. Uh, and like, I know I've experienced, I can go in a store, and if it's $25, and you give them $25 and 70 cents or whatever, and you give them something else, it just throws them off. Or if you say, hey, I have the 70 cents and they've already plugged the number into the computer, it's like, what do I do, what do I do? Well, in those days you had to figure it out in your head, so. And, you know, we've lost a lot of that. Mm -hmm. How did you think the education at Price compared with, to the white schools in Greensboro? That's kind of hard. Since <laughs> 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 I didn't go to the white school. Uh, I think we were just as well prepared. Uh, we not have, may not have had all of the books and all of the equipment or whatever, but uh, yeah, like I said, it, it, it taught us to, to be creative. And through all these other things, the extracurricular activities, we got a lot of the things that they, the other students got at the, the light schools. And I think our teachers were just as qualified, just as dedicated. And the majority of the teachers in the black schools, most of them had master's degrees, where that was not true in all of the white schools. So it may have been a better education. Okay. So well, that kind of answers the second one. Um, we had another question about, do you think that Mr. Peeler was as highly respected in the white community as he was in the Warnersville community as an educator throughout the school system? Since you were his employee too, do you think that 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 he crossed over? Or I don't know how. That I think he out. did uh, because of his father, because of the connection with his father. The Peeler Recreation Center is named after his father, not Mr. Peeler, but after mm -hmm. his father. I think because of that, and I think because of the quality of life that he led and what his beliefs and values were. And when he asked for things, mm -hmm. he probably got them. That's why we got the, the the video equipment and the radio station and some other things because he followed through and he proved that he could he would do what he said he would do. So I think he was mm -hmm. well respected by all. Uh, scary, but <laughs> I mean, when I was in high school, when I was there, I was afraid of it. You were afraid of it? It's not like it's Now, when you worked for him, did you get a different sense of him? Still afraid of him. Really? And he looked the same when I was a student as he did when school was closed, when I went back to teach. So. Hmm. Um, okay, did you have much interaction with fellow white teachers in Greensboro or the district administration when you were teaching? Um, only when we would have meetings 
like all the science teachers met, mm -hmm. or if we had a NCAE mm -hmm. meeting like that, uh, or if I went to a meeting with my husband, something like that, but not on a regular basis, so it was a once a month thing. But most of the things we did, it was still kind of divided because until we had complete segregation, there were the black science teachers and the white science teachers, but we would all get together. But then again, the black side teachers would have their own little meeting, or this group of people would get together, but we would come together as Greensboro City Schools for large curr curricular meetings or whatever. Not that much until, not, uh, until after 71. Because at that time we even had, there was even a white NCAE and a black part of NCAE. So it wasn't called, I can't remember what it was called, but it wasn't called NCAE. So even that was okay, that was separate too. Do you remember any of the, um, you've already answered all of that. I was asking about the sports teams and you listed off all of those, the academic clubs and contests, the PTA pageant, you listed pretty much all of that. Um, I'm going to do that too. Do you remember the school code? Quiet. <laughs> quiet, don't talk, don't say anything. Uh, we didn't have a school song when I was there. And when I went back as a teacher, there was a school song. I don't know the school song, but there was a school song. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew it at the time, but it has an odd rhythm song or whatever. Uh, but they did have a school song. Our school code was probably the same code that you had at your home. You know, you speak when you're spoken to. I do know we were paddled. Mm -hmm. um, and if your parents knew it, then you were paddled again when you got home. <laughs> uh, but there was respect, but there was no set of rules, or, you know, mm -hmm. like they have now, the different discipline plans. Yeah. You just knew when you went into certain teachers' rooms there were certain things you did and you did not do. And I think out of it was a, it was respect, you know, it's what you were taught at home. And you always have people that are going to push the buttons or bump, but there are not as many as we see today mm -hmm. that are openly defined. Mm -hmm. um. What was your favorite subject or subjects when you were a student at Bryce and why? I'm assuming science. Actually not. Mm -hmm. Science became... My teacher at, at Dudley was the one that turned me on to science. I actually hated science in junior high school. What was it? Probably English because I like to write, and I like the poetry part of it. We used to do little books. Uh, you'd have a poem, and then you'd have to find pictures that illustrated the poem, so I liked that part of it. Okay. And who was your favorite teacher or teachers at Price and Why? really didn't have a favorite teacher. Mm -hmm. Not at Price. They were some of the mean people. <laughs> <laughs> Who will see this? <laughs> 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 I can't hear that part. Um, no, I didn't really have um, <clears throat> a favorite teacher. As when I went back to as a teacher. I realized I did not take advantage of every opportunity. So on my planning period, I went back to my home economics class teacher and took home economics over and learned to sew. 
because that was something that I absolutely hated when I was a student. But then after I got out, I realized, hmm, I might want to learn how to sew. So I did do that. So I think sometimes, even now, we don't take advantage of what we have or what's presented to us. And we were offered a little bit of everything, home economics. Uh, mm -hmm. The guys got industrial arts. We had the art or whatever. Uh, so when I went back, I probably had favorites while I was there as a student. I didn't. <laughs> and then he has, um, you've said that you were scared of Principal Peeler. Um, what memories or impressions, I guess, made you, was it out of more of respect? Was it that type of? Um, or just respect, just... fear. You listen to what other people say about a person or about your principal, uh, and that's in the back of your mind. Uh, his eyes, like I said, his eyes were kind of, if you have a really good picture of him, you can see his eyes. And he had a way of looking at you with those eyes. You didn't ever want to be called to his, his office for any reason. So it was respect and, and, and fear, it was sort of like the unknown. What would you hear? What was the sorts of disciplinary, disciplinary actions, I guess, in his office? Paddling. Paddling. And you know, people exaggerate it. The paddle might be this big, well you know it wouldn't be this big, but that's <laughs> what you hear. Oh, he's got a paddle this big and it's this thick. Well, he couldn't even swing it, but as you're fourth, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, you believe everything. Mm -hmm. uh, students were sent home. And I didn't want to be sent home because I probably would have never been heard from again. <laughs> because you got double punishment. Whatever you did at school followed you home and you got punished for that like, all over again. So those were, th those were the things, uh, you know, some children said that, which you know isn't true, but that if you go in sometimes they never see those people again, or, mm -hmm. you know, but that's all. Do you remember his morning announcements? I remember the announcements. I don't really remember a lot about what was said or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, um, kind of touched on this. So your education at Price, how did it prepare you for your later life? You said it gave you the basics, correct? Mm -hmm. And it just gave you a great foundation to start out your... And I, I also think not only did they give us the basic as far as education is concerned, but they also taught us to be ladies and gentlemen and how to dress and how to walk and how to talk. So it was preparing you, preparing you as a student or to go out and, and, and excel, but preparing you as a person on how you dress, how you how you walk, how you talk, uh, how you fit in, blend, adjust, those kinds of things, how to be flexible. Mm -hmm. So preparing you for the real world. Um, did you teach at another school after Price? Uh, when Price closed in 1971, none of us knew where we were going. I was a little, I don't know if it was worst off, because I was pregnant. And at that time, if you were pregnant, there was no family leave. So you had to resign. So I had to resign in June of 71. And whenever they called you back, you had, you went. Uh, because they may not call you for 10 months, there may not be a, another job. So my son was five weeks old when I got a call and I went to Page High School as a biology teacher. When did you leave Page? How long did you stay at Page? Stayed at Page uh, five years. I think I left Page in 77. While I was at Page, I finished my work on my master's and I got certification for gifted education. So I uh, 
taught gifted elementary children from 77 until I retired? Well, not until I retired. I taught school for 30 years. Uh, and then in, I became teacher on special assignment, which works. Uh, I was working with first year teachers as a mentor. Uh, and basically you go out, you observe the class, you come back, you make suggestions, but we're not a part of their evaluation. Uh, and I'm doing that part time now. We're not a part of the evaluation. Uh, we go in to make sure everything is going okay. Sometimes they just want to cry, they want to vent or whatever. So we're just there to hold their hands and we don't share anything with anybody else, but we're trying to do what we can to keep good teachers in education. So that's the support system. That's awesome. Um, um, oh, how did teaching at Price prepare you for um, when you went to Page? It, it didn't really. At Price, I was in a secure environment because everybody, you know, I was the youngest in the staff. I'd gone to Price, uh, and they wanted me to succeed. So that was kind of, when I went to Page, uh, I was told, here's the key, your room is downstairs. Uh, and I'm like, but where did I put my coat? Because at Price we had a place to hang our coats, we had a place to put lunch, and you know they're looking at me like, where are you coming from? So I was sort of just thrown in there. I did not have a classroom. I floated as a biology teacher. Uh, and I started in October, which is always difficult if you don't start out the year with kids. Plus the classes, students were pulled from other teachers' classes, and usually teachers, well, students decide, all right, I like this person, I don't want to lose this person, so uh, I had several things going against me as a first year innovation. And for probably the first two or three years, I cried almost every morning. I didn't like it. And after a while, but after the first year, it did get better. Uh, I did win the students over eventually, and it, it, it got better. But I think that's why I went back to elementary. Uh, I just didn't want to. High school would be tough after elementary. I don't. I don't. <laughs> My husband taught high school, but I just, there's no way I can, no. <laughs> um, These are, um, This may be um, where you can talk about the group or the family that you guys have formed. Even though you had already, or you were at Price in 1971, how do you feel about the desegregation in 1971? How do you think it affected you as a teacher at that time? Obviously one way was that you ended up losing your job in 71, right? Well, no, you lost your job because you were pregnant. Um, how do you think it affected the teachers and students there at the time? The students were very emotional. The teachers were very emotional. I know we met right after it was announced that the school was closing. Uh, Mr. Swan and some other people went to talk to people to see what could be done. But it was a, a done deal. It had already been decided what they were going to do with it which they did open it again as an elementary school, um, but we weren't a part of, of that, and we weren't given the option of being a part of that. We were a family, and because of that, uh, that's how the idea of the Peel of Swan Price family 
came to be. Mm-hmm. So we, even though we were all at different schools twice a year, we would meet once in the spring, once in the fall and winter, and just get together and share notes. And uh, everybody would bring a colored, di- a colored, um, excuse me, a covered dish, and uh, we play. We still do play some kind of games or whatever. And then people would kind of reflect or share things that they remembered about high school, so that the history and the legacy would. Uh, would continue. Mm-hmm. So, um, and how did you find out about the closing of the school? We read it in the newspaper. And then, um, no one came to us, no one came to the school and you know, sat down and talked to the faculty and said, these are the options, this is what's going to take place. Uh, we read that they were going to do the, the, the Freeman Mill Road, that part, and, you know, we were trying to figure out, well, how do we get in? And then, you know, you read a little further, and the school is going to be closed, and this is going to happen. So, uh, but we went in the dark. And, um... How do you think the Price School should be commemorated by Greensboro College or the city today? What do you feel would be a good way to... Um... I know it's almost sort of a, a done deal. Um, I wish there was some way that they could save the building and use it maybe for field hours and then have a section set up for J.C. Price because, uh, as it has been pointed out, it is the only last remaining original part of Morrisville. Everything else has been torn down. All the churches have been, because they got larger, have, have been rebuilt or relocated or moved. Uh, and J.C. Price School is the only standing structure that is was a part of old Morrisville. Uh, I don't know how much, and I was told that they're going to keep the buildings in the back. The, mm-hmm. the, it's like the home ec building and another little building back there. But they weren't part of the original school. They were added. They were added after I left Price. So they were added after uh, 59. Um, because when we had our family, our J.C. Price, I think you've seen this. Mm-hmm. This one. Mm-hmm. Uh, after we had this, everybody went over and the Guilford Greensboro College was nice enough to let them go in and, and walk around. And a lot of people had not been back since they graduated or whatever. So it, that is that bond. And then they had another uh, reunion this year. Mm-hmm. So, uh, or if you can't, then do something in those other buildings, make a room or something that you show the history of the school. Is there anything else that you would like to add at this time? If I could, I'd just like to share part of my story. Yes. I've already honoring the legacy. This was written for the J.C. Price reunion. That was in nineteen seventy-one. Do you remember walking down the long halls at J.C. Price School, where with love teachers taught and enforced the golden rule? Do you remember back in the day learning reading, writing, and arithmetic? Yes, some of you probably danced to the tune of a hickory stick. This reunion reunion has brought us from near and far to honor and remember the past, to reflect on the good old days when living was easy and life in Warnersville was a blast. At J.C. Price, we learned to overcome our fears and sorrows and to focus our hopes and dreams on a brighter tomorrow. Our books were passed down, used or secondhand. Nevertheless, we never believed our minds were a wasteland. 
We were challenged to excel in everything we did and not to look back. We learned to focus on the bigger prize and keep our eyes on track. In the good old days, it was all right to have devotion, to sing and pray, learning at home and school that God was the only way to start the day. Mr. A. H. Peeler, the look, the eyes, the discipline, and his ever-growing vision, his teachers, staff, and students were his dream, his ongoing mission. He brought us the best in music, arts, drama, and audiovisual equipment. To him, the days at Price with each teacher, each child, was a time well spent. Bonding together for life in junior high, we made lifelong friends, lasting, binding relationships that will never end. J.C. Price provided us with some of life's greatest treasures, preparing us for a journey that cannot be measured. We learned of truth and beauty, love and peace, honor, grace and joy, we learn the worth of every Negro girl and boy. Thank you, J.C. Price School, for being our beacon, our guiding light. Thank you for helping to prepare generations to step into the spotlight. The Price family can be proud of the legacy we had leave. Each of us has touched a life and showed others how to dream and believe. The J.C. Price, Price School, not the building, but the people, you made us think and made us realize that no child, rich or poor, has to be the weakest link. We didn't know we were disadvantaged or from the wrong side of town. No one told us we could not succeed or that our heads should be bowed. We knew from the beginning, from the very first day, from our September start, that J.C. Price School, Mr. Peeler, the teachers and staff, would always have a place in our hearts, I mean in our lives, a place in our hearts. And did you write that? Can I have a copy of it? <laughs> it's not in the best shape. I was, uh... That's I can make a copy of that. Uh, if you can make a copy yeah, of that. I'm going to try to make a copy um, They have these letters, and they wanted to see if you recognized any of these letters too. I'm gonna go make a copy of these and of your newspaper article, and I'll be right back. And this is about to Hopefully, they let me. Use it Do you have the rest of that article about Mr. Peeler? No, I don't know what happened to it. I was uh, looking for it in here. If you want to look through this folder okay. and see, <coughs> these are. Let's see if there's anything in there. That That's an interesting article about him. I don't know what happened to the article. I'm not interested in moving on. I wonder if they got that article over there at the, you know, we're supposed to do the newspaper. The archive, the newspaper archive is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. They may have that article. Do you have this article? That's when he was in the hospital, and it doesn't have a date on it, but I guess you could find it.
one of these. Do you have this one? Mm-mm. 